right. Welcome everyone to Laying the Foundation, How to Create Stabilization. My name is Lydia Rhino. I am the Program Director at the Eating Disorder Foundation, and I am delighted to welcome everyone here tonight. Tonight's workshop is brought to you in collaboration with the Eating Disorder Foundation and Lightfully Behavioral Health. I'd like to share a little bit about the Eating Disorder Foundation. We are a nonprofit that was founded in 2003 with a mission to be an effective resource in the prevention and elimination of eating disorders through free and accessible education, support, and advocacy. We are a Denver-based organization that is now serving individuals and families both nationally and internationally. I want to thank anyone who's made a donation upon registration. We are able to provide free services because of the generosity of our community. I'll add the donation link in the chat if you would wish to contribute after I am done introducing everything. In addition, I would like to say a few words about Lightfully Behavioral Health. They are one of the first and only mental health care providers focused solely on primary mental health care, treating the whole person with clinical expertise deep compassion, and a rigorous commitment to measurable results. Lightfully specializes in care for depression and other mood disorders, anxiety disorders, personality disorders, trauma-related disorders, and they provide levels of care for teens and adults, and they have virtual options available. All right, if anyone has questions for our pres presenter, I invite you to use the chat feature to communicate with me directly throughout the workshop. The chat is kept confidential and will come to me directly. We'll save time for a couple of questions and answers after the presentation, and I will deliver those questions to our presenter. We will not be sharing the PowerPoint. However, we will be recording, as I mentioned earlier, and we will send the recording as soon as possible. And now I would like to read a little bit about our speaker tonight, Lolly, and introduce the conversation of the evening. Lolly Wool, LPC, NCC, and a CEDS is a licensed therapist and certified eating disorder specialist. Lolly has experience in all levels of care, treating individuals with eating disorders, substance use disorders, and mental health. Lolly is trained in EMDR and has completed the intermediate level training of somatic experience. Lolly has worked in a variety of clinical roles over the years. Currently, Lolly is the Vice President of Operations at Lightfully Behavioral Health, overseeing the adult and teen virtual IOP programs. All right, Lolly, I am going to hand it over to you for the evening. Awesome. Can you guys hear me okay? Is that good? Okay, perfect. All right, so give me two seconds to, well, first, uh, before I share my screen, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Lolly. Um, I love speaking for you all. I've done it one other time before and I just, um, I don't know, I just love what EDF does and um, this option. And so I'm a therapist by trade. I am originally from St. Louis, Missouri. I grew up there my whole life, lived there my whole life um, up until about, uh, I guess like four or five years ago. Um, and then I've moved around a little bit. I've been in Texas and now more, most recently I'm in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, I have grown up in uh, working in the treatment setting. So I've always kind of done the in like residential PHP IOP setting. Um, I've done a good majority of my time has spent working with individuals with eating disorders. And so um, I definitely have a passion there. I've done, uh, just have a lot of experience there. I love talking about it. And I've made this shift into the mental health world and it's been really helpful and really interesting. And I just think that this is something, I mean, the world's just converged so closely. And so, I mean, it's just like, you don't do one without the other. And so um, I'm excited to kind of talk a little bit about that tonight. I definitely come from like a uh, attachment trauma lens, definitely like somatic. Um, I'm very much about like what you feel in your body. If you've heard me talk before, I talk a lot about the body, a lot about what you notice in your body. Um, so I definitely bring that piece of things into it. Um, what else? Other things, it's just, I, I'm a mom. Uh, I have four kids and one on the way. Um, my kids are seven, six, almost three. And then I had a son that passed away and now I'm pregnant again. So, 
Uh, I talk about my kids a lot. Um, you'll hear me talk about it probably at some point in this presentation. So that's just something that's like important to know about me and something I value. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Please use the chat if you guys have questions. Like Lydia said, I'm not good at keeping track of questions as I go. My brain can't multitask in that way, but um, we'll look at them at, towards the end. So I would love to hear comments and um, anything, any questions. All right, now, Lydia, can you let me share my screen? Mm -hmm. There we go. All right. Let me just move you all over here and get started. So we are going to talk. It's going to take me a second. Ugh, hold on. Sorry. Can you see like the like big presentation, Lydia? Is that what you're seeing? Okay. Yeah. Um. All right. Cool. So we are gonna talk today about stabilization. I'm curious um, what people think of, I guess just in your own brains, you can kind of think of what you think of when you hear stabilization. I know it's something that we talked a lot about. I talk a lot about with current clients. I've talked a lot about in the past in different treatment centers that I've worked in. And I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of just, like associations with stabilization. I think sometimes those associations are like, oh, that's like, feels repetitive. That feels redundant. Um, I've been there, done that. I think sometimes it can, there's that like feeling of, but I need to do some of the deeper work because that's what's like going to actually create change. And so I think there sometimes can be frustration there when it's like, I'm in so much pain. I'm in so much distress. Like I want to feel better. And it feels like doing the work is going to, what's going to get me there. And when then like a team or therapist or whatever is like, yeah, but we have to focus on stabilization. I think sometimes it can feel like dismissive. So I just would challenge you all during this presentation, just to like, keep an open mind about what you think about stabilization. <laughs> Trust me, like I am someone I grew up as a therapist. I've done my own work. Like I love the deep work, you guys. Like I love going there. I, it's painful, but like I love that kind of stuff. And um, I look back at my career and I realize that there's times that I started to do work either myself or working with other individuals, and it's like I, I. I went too far ahead too quickly and it doesn't help anybody. It doesn't help. It just creates frustration. And so um, I just would challenge you all to kind of open your mind around stabilization. The other thing that I will just say, and this is like a lolly belief, so you can take it for what it is and do with it what you will. But like, to me, stabilization is doing the deeper work. Like there is no, if I cannot do any foundation, if I can't create a little some form to stand on, like some platform to stand on, like I can't move. I can't move forward. Like I have to have some footing. I have to have stable enough ground beneath me to do this. Um, and I think just, I don't know. I just, I, I think in my own experience as a therapist, I've come to realize that. And honestly, you guys, like in my own experience over the past year with my own grief I think there's been times where it's like I want to dig in and I want to like move through this and get over this and like have some relief and I have also realized like I can't do that if I'm not standing on some sort of solid ground and that looks different for everybody and so we'll talk a little bit I don't I leave kind of like what stabilization in like a very objective sense looks like pretty open and vague because I'm a firm believer of like it looks different. It would look different for Lydia than it would for me, than it would for Christina, than it would for Taylor. Like it's going to look different for all of us. And so I really would like encourage you to bring that into your own individual therapy sessions or sessions with your dietitians or treatment teams or wherever you're at in the process. 
um, and just have an open conversation about that. Because again, what stabilization is for one person, it's going to look different for someone else and it's going to look different for the next person. So there's definitely like not a black and white in my mind of like, this is what you have to achieve to achieve stabilization. I think there's some like guardrails that we can talk about and we will talk about some of those things. Um, but overall, to me, this is like a very open kind of topic and open conversation. Um, and my hope from this presentation is that you all can walk away, one, just having a like thoughtful, curious mind about like what stabilization might look like for you or your loved one or your clients, whatever context you have relationship to someone with an eating disorder with mental health stuff. Um, so just having curiosity about that. And I think starting to really, I, this sounds like corny you guys, but like starting to really like appreciate the stabilization phase of things because it just is like so foundational. And so, um, I don't know, it just like feels like so very necessary. So Lolly, before you dive in, uh, would you mind popping the presentation on slideshow mode? It, right yes. now it's showing everything. And yeah, I want to make sure. Hold on, let me stop sharing and then like redo this. Cool. I have too many monitors. So <laughs> that's part of the problem. No worries. Take your time getting all adjusted. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Okay, let me see if I can get out of. Okay, I was like, did I just exit out of you all? Okay, now, turn us again. I never really mind like seeing the main <laughs> slide and also like the preview of what's to come. Just preview. Well, if so I can't that, get that it, might be fine with me, but. You might still get it. Okay, let's see if I can do this. Share screen one. Okay, now, let's do this. And play, and now swap. How does that look? That's the full screen. Okay, Beautiful. perfect. Okay. So when we start to think about stabilization, like I said already, like I think about foundation. And when I was thinking about doing this presentation, I was thinking about like, how do you um, describe foundation? Because again, I think that can look like, um, so many different ways and different different looks, different ways mean different things for different people. And I think that thing that I kept on coming back to was like, the idea of foundation isn't that there's no issues. It isn't that I'm going along my merry way and because I have the solid foundation, building the house means that there's nothing wrong. There's never any electrical issues. There's never any plumbing issues. There's never any foundation issues. That's not true. There are issues when you build a house and you're going to run into things and you're going to have to like regroup, replan, start over, um, adjust your plans, whatever that might be. But the idea is when I'm looking at where to build my house, like there's a difference of like building my house on like solid ground versus like sand um, or something a little less stable. And I love the beach. I love the sand. And when I think about something that I want to be able to withstand wind, withstand storms, withstand <laughs> different seasons or different um, weather, different situations, like I want something that can stand and be um, found, uh, like firm in that foundation. And so in that, um, I think about that when we start to talk about recovery and whether that's like mental health or eating disorder, when you're thinking about stabilization, it's not that you have everything perfect. It's not that you have everything ready to go and it looks great. And just because you have the solid foundation, it's gonna, you know, everything's gonna work the way that it's supposed to work. That's not true. We know that. That's not how life goes. That's not how healing goes. Um, and so, it's about saying, do I have a foundation that I feel I can move through harder times with? Um, and I think when I think about stabilization, I think about like, to me, when I'm in a stable place or when I'm working with someone and they're in a stable place, they're able to withstand 
shifts and changes. I use like mono weather analogy, whatever, let's go with it. But I could withstand some wind. I could withstand a storm. I could withstand a, um, a, bl a blizzard. Some of these things might hurt. Some of these things might be painful. They might knock me down to my knees. They might slow me down, but like my whole foundation isn't going to get wrecked because of the, the forces that I'm encountering. Because what we know is when we start to do our therapeutic work, again, whether that's around like attachment or trauma or anything, like it's going to be hard. It's going to be painful. It's not going to be like this easy walk in the park. Like I have to trudge through my grief. Like I have to like physically like work my way through it. And it feels so painful sometimes. And it's not an easy road. And I know that it feels more tolerable when the road that I'm walking on or the foundation that I have around stabilization feels more firm um, than if I'm trying to like work through something that feels really painful and requires a lot of like grit and vulnerability and um, accountability. If I don't have that foundation, I'm way more likely to get knocked down. And then what happens is that's like what gets us into this cycle sometimes of like flooding. And so it's like, we don't want to flood. We want activation is okay. We are all going to feel activation. We're all going to feel activation in our therapeutic process. Um, what, what we what we are trying to avoid is just like constantly flooding. So constantly having your nervous system get into a place of like over, you know, like this is too much. I can't handle this. This is like so dysregulated. So stabilization is not a black and white situation. Like I've said, um, it's not all or nothing. It's not like I have to follow my meal plan hundred percent or zero percent. It's not that I'm if I was self-harming, I can never self-harm. It's not, um, it's not black and white. Uh, for some, I think stabilization is like baby steps. I do, when I was thinking about how do I like, I don't know about you guys, but like sometimes I like, I know what stabilization is. Like I know it in my brain. I know it in my body, but sometimes it's like hard to put the words to it. And so I was thinking about like, how do I put the words to this? And I think one thing that kept on coming back to for me was like this idea of consistency is like, am I showing up in a consistent way that is also like moving forward in my own recovery or in my own process? So to me, that's not that I'm 100% consistent on my meal plan. Maybe that's that I am making progress. And I start off at 25% consistency with my meal plan. And then I increase that to 50%. Maybe that means I am, um, you know, binging every day of the week. And I have a goal to start to only binge five days out of seven days. And then I like slowly titrate that down. And so I think to me, that's part of stabilization. It's not that I have to get to this end goal before I can move on into my therapeutic work. And that end goal means I have to be perfect or have like total abstinence. I can't relapse. I can't lapse any of that kind of stuff. But I do think it is asking yourselves, asking clients, asking treatment teams, whatever it might look like for you, asking your loved ones, like, what does it look like for me to show up consistently right now in my process? And what does it look like to move forward in my process? And like, how do I do those things together? And if I can do those things together, to me, that's like the, the foundation of stabilization. That's how we get to a place where then we can start to build, um, build muscles and build uh, experiences that we're not used to having from a, like an emotional experience um, or a vulnerability experience. I always show this line. I feel like whenever I talk because it just like clicks, I'm a visual person and I just like really love the way this slide um, really demonstrates, I think, polyvagal theory and the central nervous system. And so the way to think about this, sometimes if you see this, you'll see the green in the middle. 
So you might see an example of that. And it's all kind of the same thing. But the idea is that when we're in this social engagement down here in the bottom in the green, like that's when we're in a regulated place. Like when I am in my ventral, when my ventral vagal part of my brain is like activated, I can connect with my kids. I can be engaged in my life. I can uh, learn new things, learn new skills. And so we're not going to live down here. I don't live down here. No one lives down here all the time. Like I am here and then my kids get off the bus and they're like crazy people running around this house. And I like hop up into this like fight flight place of like anxiety and like trying to get everything organized and I'm not down there. So we all bounce between these places. So don't think that it's like, I have to get always in this regulated place. That's not the goal. What would be the goal is that if I spend 100% of my life or 90% of my time in this like fight flight place or in this freeze place. So fight flight is like, fight obviously is like anger where you feel like always in conflict where you can just feel irritated, frustrated a lot. Um, flight obviously is like, I wanna get away. I have a lot of fear, anxiety, worry, concern. I am someone like, I don't know, I don't know, but like I was born in flight mode. Like I feel like I was just born into flight mode. Like I'm always, um, I tend to be someone that like runs really fast and I'm I'm someone who is um, inclined towards like anxiety and fear and worry and all that kind of stuff. And then there's also freeze. And so sometimes what can happen when we experience trauma, whether that's like, again, I use trauma in the sense of like, that could be medical trauma, that could be sexual trauma, that could be emotional trauma, a lot falls into that bucket. But what happens sometimes when we experience trauma is there's this initial reaction of like, get away or fight, whichever feels appropriate, what can I do? And then sometimes if we can't engage in either one of those, that's when sometimes our brain will go into freeze mode, which is solely out about safety and protection. It's saying like, I can't win this fight. You know, like if I'm a little kid and my fight is with my dad, my dad's a big dude. He's like very tall. He has like a very strong personality. Like as a little kid, it was like, I'm not winning this battle with him. And so there became a place in my brain where it's like, I go into freeze mode where it's like, I'm just going to disconnect. Some people shut down. This is where we experience shame hopelessness, we can feel trapped or stuck in these places. So you might looking at this, find yourself like, Hey, I kind of find myself that I find, like I said, like I tend to sit in flight mode more that often than not. Um, some people experience a pretty like consistent vacillation between all of those. What can happen though, when we experience trauma or when we experience trauma that doesn't get processed. So when we go through things that happen to us that happen too fast, too quick for our brain to process. And then we don't have time or the safety or the space to process those things afterwards. Sometimes we can get like stuck. Our nervous system can get like kind of stuck or hijacked in those places. And so for me, it's like, I can kind of get stuck in that fight flight mode. And I have to do a lot to get myself back into like a somewhat of a regulated space. And so for me, as I like started to do my own work, my work was really starting to say like, how do I regulate enough to get into this like social engagement part? I might just like dip my toe in there. Like at the beginning of this process, you might just go there for a second. It might not last long. It might not feel long, but we just want to like slowly start to increase the way that we get into that place so that we can do more of the work in therapy. I think it is important to notice that like, or to note, I guess, that like when we're not nourishing our bodies in a consistent way and we're engaging in eating disorder behaviors, obviously like that impacts our brain, that impacts cognition, that impacts brain functioning and that impacts our central nervous system. And so that's part of why I think stabilization, there is a lot of conversations about meal plans and meal plan consistent, consistency sometimes when we're talking about this, because 
we could have all the skills, but if I'm not nourishing my body, it's like I might not have the ability to get out of that stuck on place um, as easily as I might if I'm nourishing my body. Um, the other thing that I'll say about this slide that I think is important is in social engagement, when we're in the ventral vagal, so when we're in our sympathetic or dorsal vagal, part of our brain is like in gear and like highly activated, we usually don't have a whole lot of learning that can take place. So when I am in fight, flight, or freeze mode, like new skills, new learning won't land in my brain because it's like just about survival. It's just about, I just need to survive whatever I feel like is happening, whether that's like a perceived threat, an actual threat, whatever it might be. And so that's why it's also important when we think about stabilization to get into that, like have that ventral vagal be activated because as you're doing more processing work and therapy, for those new core beliefs to start to stick, for those new neural pathways to start to form. And when I say that, I mean like, if I'm doing work, I grew up in a household. My dad's an engineer, not a super emotional guy. My mom is just not like a super emotional, wasn't a super emotional woman as we were growing up. And I grew up in a household where it was like, my feelings are like overreactions. What I was feeling was like too much. You're overreacting. Just like chill out, Lolly. This isn't a big deal. Buck up. And so when I started to do processing therapy in order for me to be able to revise that belief to say like actually my like feelings were very valid and like what I'm feeling then and what I'm feeling now is like appropriate and makes sense and what my body is telling me makes sense for that whole core belief to start to be able to like sink in in my brain I have to have at least a little bit of this ventral vagal online so that my brain can take in that new information and like hold on to that information. Sometimes, like I've used this in the past. So if any of you out there know me, you probably have heard me say this, but it's like, we don't want to throw stuff at a Velcro wall and have nothing stick. Like that is just painful and, and hard for everybody involved. And so to me, the social engagement ventral vagal part of our brain is what allows things to start to stick to the wall so that we don't just like keep feeling like we're spinning our wheels. So I'm going to talk a little bit about distress tolerance. I don't know about you all, but sometimes I feel like distress tolerance is just like a word that people like use and like kind of throw around. And I always like have to be like, what actually does this mean? Um, there's a book and I'm not going to remember the name of it right now. Um, I wish I could, uh, but they talk about what kind of wellness means in distress tolerance. And I really like the description. I'm going to not do a fair job of it, but essentially they describe it as like being able to move in the world and move between states, um, I guess like somewhat freely um, without kind of getting stuck in one place or another. So what happens, I think when we use eating disorder, self-harm, other different coping strategies, what happens is we don't learn how to move between like emotion number one and emotion number two. And so it's like, I can live in emotion. Um, let's say like I can live in, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. I can live in fear. I can stay there. Fear is comfortable for me. I know fear, but like, if I start to hit into sadness, like, oh gosh, that feels like way too overwhelming. I don't think I can handle it. I need something to like stop this from happening. And that's where sometimes we can use eating disorder behavior, self-harm, substance abuse, sex, all the things, shopping, work, I mean, all the things. And so we end up kind of breaking that cycle. And so what we don't ever learn is like, hey, I can be I can have fear and then I can move into sadness and then maybe I can move into like relaxation or contentment, whatever it is. And I can move between like all these different emotions. It might take effort to move between those emotions. I might have to like practice some skills to like move and get myself moving kind of fluidly, 
but I don't get stuck in one place or another. And there isn't a like strong resistance to touch an emotion or to connect with emotions. And so what we want to do in stabilization is start to build like that bandwidth of being able to go from one emotion to the, another emotion and being able to say like, here are the emotions I feel comfortable feeling and here are the emotions I don't feel comfortable feeling, but like, let me start to think, practice what it would be like to feel this a little bit and move away without using my eating disorder, without using self-harm, without using whatever coping mechanism you might utilize. And so that's one of the ways that I think about distress tolerance is this idea of like, I can move between different emotions and I can, I can start to increase my ability to feel emotions that maybe in the past have felt not okay to feel for whatever, all the reasons that we have. Lots of different reasons there. So the other way that I think about the stress tolerance is this idea of the stress tolerance is also the ability to not like get sucked in to the most activating part of something as soon as I touch it. So um, thinking about an example, I'm going to just use my son, Samuel, he passed away last year. I'm going to use his death as an example, because that's like the freshest one in my mind right now when I think about this. So for me, distress tolerance doesn't like, it isn't that every time I think about Samuel, I go to kind of my most activating memories around his death. There are times that, that happens. I, there are times that that happens. And then the work is like, okay, how do I kind of pull back a little bit? Cause this feels like too much. And so for me, when it came to distress tolerance and my grief, it was, how do I start to like touch into other things around Samuel and my grief, but not get like sucked into the memory of his death and like get totally flooded by that. Cause that can feel so overwhelming. There are times that I need to go there. And there are times that I need to talk about that and navigate that and feel that in therapy and with my husband and my kids and all the things. And I also don't like, I can't walk around all day, every day, thinking about the most painful moments of his life and death and like being stuck in that place. Cause it's just unbearable. It's just like, it just, it's just unbearable. And so what I would ask you guys to think about is when you think about something that's super activating, this could be an event, this could be food, this could be not using a behavior, this could be an event coming up, this could be anything, anything that's activating, you could kind of think about like as this like middle dot. And so starting to think about distress tolerance is like, okay, how do I like start to feel something on the outer edges of this? Like, how do I start to feel something where I'm just like dipping my toe in and like what happens and like, how do I not let myself start to like become so flooded by that? And that's part of the stress tolerance and that's part of the stabilization process. When we use behaviors to manage our distress, I want to just be like really clear in the fact that like distress is just like a part of life. Like I would love to not feel distress and I feel it every single day in some capacity, right? Um, I think one of the hardest parts of stabilization work is starting to separate out the like the the belief that like activation feels unsafe or not okay or dangerous or whatever. And so how do I start to like re, um, reframe that belief to say like activation feels scary, but like in this moment, it's not dangerous. Like in this moment, I'm okay. I can navigate this. 
when we use behaviors to manage our distress or our activation and that and that keeps our like distress tolerance window super super small when we use behaviors we end up like sending messages to ourselves of like i can't handle this my feelings aren't valid i can't trust myself i can't trust my emotions um my son is just finishing kindergarten this year he finishes like next week i can't believe it but I always use this analogy to like, if you're in a classroom with a bunch of kindergartners, they're, they're wild people. If you're not familiar with kindergartners, they're wild. And if the teacher, like if there was a fire drill and the like fire drill goes off and the teacher's like, everybody's freak out. Like, oh my God, we can't handle this. It's crazy. Like Teddy and all his friends are going to go crazy. They're not going to like walk out in any sort of orderly way, Right. But if the teacher says like, hey guys, the fire drill is going out. I need you to follow directions. I know this is scary. I know this feels X, Y, and Z. And here's what I want you to do. Like I'm here, this is gonna be okay. And so that's part of like the difference between I think showing up in our own process around distress tolerance and activation and stabilization is when we show up from a place that is more, um, like eating disorder led or just like maladaptive kind of stuff led, um, really trauma response led. Uh, I think we send that message of like, I got everybody freak out, like this is not okay. And what we want to start to do is say like, that might have been true then, but now like I'm gonna try and show up in a different way. And what I want to like, what I want the message to myself, what I want the message to myself to be is, this feels really scary and really hard. And I like, I trust myself. I trust my team. I trust my therapist, to like help me navigate this. Like I, the, the, the self-talk might be like, I know in the past I've been told I can't trust my emotions, but like, I can trust my emotions. Like, let me like, listen to them. Let me pay attention to them. And like, let me try this and see what might happen. So we want to start to like, that helps shift that distress tolerance. Whereas when we're always kind of stuck in more maladaptive ways of dealing with activation or distress or emotions or whatever it is, we end up, I think sometimes like reaffirming like negative beliefs that we've been told or that we believe about ourselves, our emotions. And we want to start to like, work that out because that is part of what keeps us kind of stuck. Like I said, oh mom, I think in kids books oftentimes. So if anybody's ever read the book, uh, the bear, uh, going on a bear hunt, they say like, we can't go over it. We can't go under it. We have to go through it. Um, I so wish you guys, like, I just wish there was a different way and there's not, um, I picked the mud picture because that just felt very appropriate based on like my own process right now and my own experience but there isn't a way around this like the way the way to increase distress and the way um distress tolerance and to increase your tolerance to activation therefore increasing like stabilization and increasing your ability to do more work in therapy and make more movement in recovery or more movement in your process is to go through it. And again, I like want to be very clear in that like that is not a pain-free process. Like that hurts. Like walking through the mud and the stuff is not fun and it can feel so painful and it can bring us to our knees and the just like the the rawness of it is hard and what I do believe is like it will not feel like this forever but I have to keep doing what I'm doing on a consistent basis and like keep moving forward if I can do that like it will shift at some point in time and it might get a little easier and then it might get hard again, but like it will not remain this way forever. What I think can like make us feel that way sometimes is like when we are really stuck 
we feel very stuck and it feels that way over and over again. Um, and so I just always think of this with my kids, with myself, with clients of like, I would love to have a different way around this. I would love to teach you all and have that like, you know, magic wand and it doesn't exist. But what I can say is like, that's where like part of stabilization is about like saying like, how do I build trust with myself and my team that they are going to be with me or my loved ones, my friends, partners, whatever it might be, that they're going to help me navigate through this. Stabilization is developmental. So I just like feel like this is important to say and name because I think sometimes even for myself, I can be like, oh, this feels so silly. Like, why am I stuck here? Why am I struggling with this? Why am I doing this? Whatever. And I have to remember that like, this is part of like developmental learning. And sometimes we like missed this. Sometimes we didn't get this. Sometimes maybe we weren't taught it. Maybe it was practiced like inconsistently. Um, but again, I think it's like, even when we think about developmental steps and progress and all that kind of stuff, um, I always think about like, I don't want to build my house on sand. Like I want to build a foundation and I have a really good relationship with my parents today. And I can also say like, I have a good relationship with them and there's things that the, I, I didn't get. And like, that's okay. I can have compassion and love. And I can also say like, I also have things that were missed and needs that were missed and it's okay for me to figure out how to relearn how to do those things as like a grown ass woman. Um, Cause sometimes I feel like oh, I should know how to do this or I should, you know, know how to do this. I think one thing that does help me is I always like look at my kids and my oldest daughter is seven and she is like me in mini form. Like, oh, she's just like, so me. And there's moments where I'm like, oh, I just want to like protect her from like this painful thing or like I want to like veer her off this path and like don't you don't have to go down this road like I know how this goes and it's not worth it and all the things and one thing we have in our house um I like love this so much because it is so much how I want to show up for myself and how I want to show up for my children um we, I have the Brene Brown Parenting Manifesto um, in our house. It's like on a big piece of wood. And there's a line in it that I love. And it says, together we will cry and face fear and grief. I will want to take your pain away, but instead I will sit with you and I will teach you how to feel it. To me, like that's part of stabilization, y'all. Like that is what like this is about, is me saying to myself, like, I don't want to feel this. Like, I wish I could not feel this grief. I wish I could not feel this pain. And I'm going to figure out like how to navigate through this. And I'm going to ask for help and I'm going to have people show me how to do this, but I'm not going to just try and make it go away because like that doesn't teach me anything. That doesn't help me build any sort of competence around navigating my emotions or navigating, um, feelings or pain or grief or any of that. And so I just, I love this line specifically in the wholehearted parenting manifesto, but in general, it's a great piece of like, it's not about like doing it perfectly or making it all like doing it all the right way. It's really about like saying like, I'm going to let you see me be human and I'm going to show up and I'm going to like walk alongside of you along this path. And I think sometimes like that's the inner dialogue I have to have with myself too, is like, I don't want to feel this and I'm like not going anywhere. Like I'm going to, you know, figure out how to navigate this and we're going to like feel through it, not feel around it or above it or below it. So objective stabilization, it's like, what does this look like objectively? We've talked a lot about like, I've talked a lot about what this looks like from like an, uh, a like emotional lens, but what does this look like 
literally. It could look a lot of different ways. And this is where like, I'm gonna send, like say some ideas, but you all take this and like think about it as it relates to yourself, your loved one, clients, whatever it might be. So one thing is like increased medication compliance that can like allow for more stabilization. If I'm having really big shifts in my mood or a lot of anxiety or a lot of depression, like more consistent I can be with medication, the more able I might be to navigate some of my activation and some of my distress. Again, talk to your psychiatrist. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not an MD. And I just think that this is one of the things that can look like, am I doing this consistently? And am I showing up for myself in this way consistently? Sometimes it can look like increasing meal plan compliance. Again, that doesn't mean that I go from zero to a hundred. Maybe it's like, how do I make small steps that are consistent steps that I can practice consistently and continue to do and move forward? Um, I think it can look like setting goals around decreasing eating disorder behaviors, um, decreasing self-harm behaviors. A big one is just like increasing honesty. Um, this is like a little bit of a side, but someone one time was talking to me about relationships. This was like a long, long time ago. And they had me like make a list of like my ideal partner. And then they asked me like, are you being the woman that that person would want to be with? And I was like, oh, no, I'm not. Um, and I think for me, a part of like having a solid foundation is like also knowing like, am I being honest with myself, with, for me, like with my husband, with my therapist, um, with my close friends around me, or am I like keeping it all inside and being like really shut down and not practicing vulnerability? And like, how do I do that in a consistent way? And again, like, how do I make like small steps to like improve upon that? Um, and so honesty can look like honesty about behaviors, but also just like honesty about like, how am I doing? Where am I at? What's going on with me? Increasing social connection. This is like a little secret, but I would love to like try. I, I think I can sometimes do things all by myself and I don't need anybody. That is not true. I've been proved wrong on that front so many various times. And for me, this is a big one. Like if I, I can do all the things, but if I'm staying like really isolated in my world and in my own like small space, um, it's really hard for me to have a foundation. Like I have to keep reminding myself that like as humans, like part of being human is like needing, requiring human connection. And that requires me to like consistently have some sort of social connection. Again, whether that be with my, my friends, sometimes it's like having, you know, for me, like not zoning out my phone when I'm with my kids, but like, what are those things that like, I know could allow me to have more um, connection with other humans. And then daily connection to my body and my emotions. Um, again, like this doesn't have to look like I spend all day in my body, no one does. Um, but like, if you spend no time in your body, like, okay, what would it be like to spend two minutes doing like a body scan or, you know, checking in with yourself five times a day for one, you know, 10 seconds about like, what am I feeling in my body? What am I feeling emotions wise? What does that look like? So when we talk about like a more measurable, I guess, like objective stabilization, these are some of the things that I think you all probably are very familiar with and know and hear all the time. But I think it's like thinking about these as it relates to like the distress tolerance and activation and like, how do I start to build these two things at the same time? Because doing and shifting any of these is gonna cause activation, right? So just something to think about. Chicken or the egg. <laughs> I feel like this is always part of the conversation, which is like, I can't increase and I can't increase my meal plan. I can't decrease the amount that I'm binging. I can't decrease the amount that I'm exercising until my PTSD is managed or until my depression is managed or until my anxiety is managed. There's no 
there's no like secret formula to this one. Um, and there's no like X, Y, and Z has to be done. And then you can do this. Like this is a very intermingled like process. And so to me, that's where part of the stabilization conversation is having open and honest conversations with those around you, those that love you, our treatment teams, and being able to really say like, when do we push a little bit and like push into more of the processing work? And when do we need to pull back a little bit and focus on like stabilization? I don't, again, I think I said this at the beginning, like stabilization is not like an end point where it's like, oh, if I just get to this mile marker, then I'm done, check, I will be good for the rest of my life. To me, stabilization and processing work is like, I do some stabilization and then I start to process and then I need to do a little bit more stabilization and then I process. So it's not this like one and done kind of thing. It is this constant back and forth. And so if you find yourself getting kind of stuck in those conversations or having those conversations, I would challenge you to say like, I use this phrase of like, what does solid enough look like? And so again, like I don't need perfection, but I do need to have some foundation, right? I need to have some ground to stand on. Um, what do I need to do so that I can be able to take in new information? Like how do I get into that ventral vagal part of my brain a little bit more than what I'm doing now? And so again, I don't think it's like a black and white kind of thing, but I do think having thoughts and conversations and being curious around what do I need to do right now in my life to create a little bit more of a foundation and what does that look like both objectively, like from a like measurable standpoint and behaviorally, but also from like an emotional regulation standpoint. And again, reminding yourself that it's not that, you know, I always say this, like, I want to hear people's stories. I want to help them get relief from the pain that they have, but I don't want you to have to do that 5,000 times. Like, I want you to be able to do that and have that stick and have that make some like traction and progress so that you're starting to feel some relief over time from some of the stuff that is driving everything else. Um, so just being really open to that kind of conversation. And again, I always think of like, what is solid enough? What is safe enough? What is foundation enough look like for me? Okay, that was a lot. I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. Are there any questions or thoughts around anything? Lolly, this was so beautiful. I really love the quote by Brene Brown, of course, but I pictured it with the sandcastle too, of like someone like building a sandcastle alongside someone and helping set up that foundation rather than building the sandcastle for them and being like, look how good I can do it, but really like working together. I so, love that. Yes, that's so good. I love it. All right. I have a few questions and then there's two points that someone, people reflected to me. Yeah. Yes. Like for you. And I want to share those too. Um, so early on in the presentation, um, there was a use of the word activation and some folks aren't as familiar with that term. I was wondering if you could share. Yeah. Yep. Mm, I wish I had like a good definition. This is like a good takeaway. I will come up with a good definition for future. Activation is like anything that like feels like Activation could be sadness. Activation could be fear. Activation could be anger. Activation could be like excitement or like joy. So I use activation not in like a only a negative connotation, but more so of like I am moving from like my kind of normal like status quo into like something above or below what that looks like. And so like I like I said, like I have activation when my kids get off the bus and my house is a crazy train. I, you would have activation if you like almost get in a fender bender, like that adrenaline rush. You might have activation sitting down to a meal and like having something that feels really scary or being in a new environment of eating that like is not your normal kind of rotation. So activation, I feel like, yeah, is like anything kind of outside your normal, like 
hey, I'm kind of chugging along, I feel content. I would say that activation can also like include numbness. Like if you are like super disconnected, really depressed, really dissociated, like that's just a different form of activation. So activation doesn't always mean like high of like fight flight. Activation can be freeze, shame, hopelessness, helplessness. Perfect. Thank you. Um, another question. Are there physical things you can do to regulate, I believe is the vagus nerve and spend more time in the social engagement place? Yes. So it's a little specific. So if you're someone who like is more shut down, to be able to kind of like start to get some activation to get into that ventral vagal, you want to do stuff things that are going to like shift you out of the freeze response. So a lot of times when I'm talking about like the parasympathetic, so like, again, freeze mode, I'm like things that are going to help me get my body like back online and like back into a place where my nervous system is kind of like in the here and now, honestly, is going to involve like movement, <laughs> not like excessive movement, but like, it could be as simple as like, I need to like start to like move like my feet and just like notice like how my muscles move and notice that I like actually can move my feet. A lot of times people in like freeze or like a numb or dissociative state can feel like, like I feel like very frozen in my body. And so any kind of like movement, um, I like always say like move your actual like neck around, like up, down. People will look around with their eyes sometimes when they're trying to like become a little bit more regulated. And like, if you're doing a grounding exercise, they might, someone might say like, Hey, name five things in my office that are pink. You need to like actually move your head around, not just your eyes. Cause a lot of times when those of us have that have, if you've experienced freeze and certain cir circumstances, you probably have, were able to move your eyes, but not the rest of your body. Cause it wouldn't have been safe. And so what we want to do is help the brain say like, actually, I know it feels like I'm frozen again, but I actually can like move my body around. So if you find yourself down in that lower place, like trying to find things that's going to like encourage movement of your body in a connected way, not in a like fast, vigorous way. Um, and then if you're someone who is like me in the fight flight place, a lot of times I have to do like mindfulness exercises. Like I have to like slow down. I have to like turn off my cell phone. Like I have to do, I know you can all roll your eyes. I roll my eyes at myself when I put on my like meditation app at night, but like, I have to be like, what do I notice in my body right now? Like I have to get very like inward focused and like start to pay attention to what that looks like. Those are two things. The last thing that I'll say about this is I know we're at, almost at time if you are like have kids or animals in your life, that like is another great way to like get into this place. Because a lot of times with kids or animals, we all feel like a level of safety oftentimes that maybe we don't feel interacting with other adults or other humans in our world. And so that can be like just spending time with your dog or your cat and like just starting to like connect with them can be a way that you start to build that like ventral vagal part of your brain of like, I can connect, I can feel safe and connect to something else or like another living kind of thing. And usually animals and children, there's so much like innocence and playfulness and like kindness there that like, it kind of can break through some of that like protective stuff that we all feel. Good question super helpful to think about and just to be reminded that there's things that we don't need to be like in a different place to do or have all of that like all the extra stuff it's more yeah. accessible so yeah. I love that and I appreciate that I do know that we are at time so if it is okay with you Lolly, I will send you some of the remaining questions yeah. and some of the really helpful comments that people had takeaways from today absolutely um, yeah Thank oh, you thank all you. so much for spending your Thursday night with me or Thursday afternoon. I really appreciate it. Awesome. All right. This was recorded. So we will be sending it out within hopefully 48 hours, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. And Lolly, thank you so much.
for helping us all create a foundation tonight of just connection and community and learning more about this process. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.